And we are uh, finishing up our series here uh, that we started at the beginning of the year, um, taken from this verse, Proverbs 18, verse 14. The Bible says, The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. And uh, over the last few weeks, we've looked at uh, a wounded spirit, um, looked at it from several different angles, looked at depression, we looked at discouragement, we looked at uh, different stories in scripture of folks that just, I mean, had a hard time. And this time of year, it kind of gets on us. We're coming out of winter now. Hopefully uh, some of that will change. But throughout the winter and uh, days uh, seem to be uh, shorter and darkness comes our way and the cold weather and sickness and all of that just kind of gets on us. It, it gives us sometimes a spirit of the season. But uh, also um, we, we talked about folks that uh, in spite of that even, uh, just seasons in life as well and things that we go through and uh, different time periods that we sustain. And we've looked at that several weeks and I, I finished up everything that I had and then I ran across some material. I actually ran across a message um, by Charles Spurgeon. And as I read through it, just the wisdom that was there, I, I could not help but pass on. And so I have a lot of his material this morning. I didn't want to just get up and read one of his messages, uh, but for the most part, uh, that is what we're going to look at today. Um, I will be giving the, most of the, the uh, content of it to you today, um, but if you want to look it up, um, uh, the title of it is The Cause and Cure of a Wounded Spirit. And so I just want to share a little bit with that uh, of that with you, tie it into what we've talked about. And uh, I feel that it would just kind of tie up this whole series very well and share some thoughts with you here as we think about the cause and the cure of a wounded spirit. So let's pray and we'll jump in this morning. Father, we're grateful today for your goodness to us. And Lord, just the opportunity we have to be here, uh, Lord, whether it be in person or virtually tuned in, we thank you for the, um, uh, the options we have, Lord. Uh, to be able to hear the message and to uh, be one uh, as far as our spirit is concerned and knit together. We thank you for those that have taken time out of their day, Lord, to be here and those that were not able to be here but still made an effort, Lord, to tune in and to be part of the services. We pray you'd be a blessing to each and every one. And Lord, even those that might hear this later on through broadcast or recording, uh, Lord, we ask that you would continue to do a work in our hearts through it all. We thank you for the truths that we've gleaned from your word when it comes to the wounded spirit. And Lord, I pray that we would uh, not only seek your help in our lives, but in the lives of others. Lord, I pray you'd raise up those that are not feeling well, even this week and the last few weeks we've been praying for. Just, Lord, fight the devil on our behalf. I pray that you would just help us to uh, be in good health and good strength uh, throughout our Christian life this week. I pray you'd go before us today in all that is said and done, that you might get the honor and the glory and that you might be the preeminence. And Lord, that we would have uh, just a good day in your house that would uh, equip us for the week ahead, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The cause and the cure of a wounded spirit. We talked about many different versions of a wounded spirit, and Spurgeon in his message uh, narrowed this down and talked about several specific types of wounded spirits and things that could, that could um, bring those about. Uh, but he said this, every man sooner or later has some kind of infirmity to bear. And um, we can think about that in many different ways. Uh, it can be disease and pain. Uh, accident or decline of health, the physical aspects of life, uh, that can come around and be, it can be hard to deal with. Um, those um, with, that we know that are dealing with health issues and problems that way and uh, just the pains of life. I turned 35 yesterday and so I'm just, I'm ready for all the, the ailments that come with it. And I'm trying to welcome them with open arms. That way I just, there's no complaint. It's just part of what's coming. And uh, I was telling somebody, I said, I reached halfway. I said, what do you mean? I said, Lord promised three score and 10. That's 70 years. I'm at the halfway mark. And uh, I, I hope I don't have another 35 years. Not because I don't want to live, but because I hope he's on his way. And uh, we'll just be finished and be done. And, you know, it, 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 it's everybody's hope. You know, you want, you know, some kind of a cheat, some kind of an out. And uh, the Lord may be another 35 years. We don't know. Uh, but if he does, I'll go forward in, in the strength that he's given me. But diseases, pains, accidents, decline of health, that happens to everybody. And it's not uncommon for that to lead to a wounded spirit. Uh, an infirmity of mind, whether it be something that has troubled you, trauma that's taken place, um, things that happen within the mind, things that would cause us to have doubt and fear and unsettledness. 
Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, some kind of a um, uh, some kind of a conflict between people, uh, whether it be family issues or uh, even on the job or just things you're worried about, the state of the world and the way things are. Uh, all of these can lead to our spirit as well. And then he mentions a cross to carry of some kind, some burden that you must take on, whether that be physical, spiritual, mental, uh, emotional, just something that we carry with us and it becomes something that we often bear. And he says this, to bear that infirmity is not difficult when the spirit is sound and strong. The Bible tells us the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. And that is an encouragement to know. When our spirit is strong, when it is sound, we can bear that infirmity. The spirit of a man will bear his infirmity. And uh, some of that just comes from our human spirit. Sometimes human strength can get us through. We can steel ourselves against uh, unhappiness. We can prepare ourselves for disappointment. We can be ready for all of that. Uh, a lot of the, the thinkers of yesteryear, the Stoics and all that, prepared themselves for hardship. And uh, when it came, they were ready for it. And the, their own spirit, just themselves, were able to bear it. Now, a lot of times, a good, healthy person can bear a lot of infirmity just based on their own spirit. Talking to friends, having a, a, a healthy life that um, you know cultivates happiness in their own life and, and goals that they set that they meet and then cultivates uh, a, you know, a spirit of, of, of uh, perseverance in their life, the spirit of a man. But what is the wounded spirit that he talks about in verse number 14? Uh, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. He says, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? And the thought we want to draw to today, this morning, is that our spirit can endure, can overcome. But when that spirit is wounded, then we find ourselves at an advantage. Who can bear the wounded spirit? And it's not so much that the spirit can't bear our infirmity. That, that is a problem. Our infirmity then makes it worse because our spirit is wounded. But the spirit itself needs to be repaired before then our infirmity can be taken care of. So many folks walk around this world with an infirmity and their infirmity is their focus. And they say, well, this is the issue, this temptation or, or this sin or this fear or doubt or anxiety or, or this thing is crippling me. But what they don't realize or understand is that the spirit underneath that, their spirit has been wounded and they cannot carry that. Even if they understand it, even if they have it all figured out, even if they have every verse in scripture against the thing that is keeping them back, if that spirit remains wounded, they cannot carry it. A wounded spirit, he says, who can bear? It's not that the spirit can't bear the infirmity anymore. It's that I can't bear the spirit. So what is a wounded spirit? I'm going to read this. I'm going to go slowly because there's a lot of thought here. But he says, a wounded spirit... Who can bear? It cannot bear its own infirmity, so it becomes a load to itself. And the question is not what can it bear, but who can bear it? A wounded spirit, the question is who can bear? He says, one has been disappointed in love. That is very sad, but still it is a trial that can be endured. And we begin to see the spectrum of things that could wound us. He talks about disappointment in love. That's gonna wound your spirit. Yet our spirit ought to be able to bear that infirmity. He says, nobody ever suffered. Or, no, I'm sorry, the, the quote that we often hear from people in circumstances like this is, nobody ever suffered as I have done. Nobody's ever treat, nobody was ever treated as I have been. Isn't that the way we look at our problems? Nobody's ever had it this way. Nobody, this, I am exclusive in my issue. He says, such statements are altogether wrong. He says, be not like the Spartan boy who put the fox into his bosom and carried it there, though it was gnawing at his flesh and eating right into his heart. There are some people who are so unwise as to make earthly objects their supreme delight, and those objects become like foxes that gnaw to their soul's destruction. I will only say this about such wounded hearts as these. There is a good deal of sin mingled with the sorrow and a great deal of pride. A great deal of creature worship and of idolatry there. There are those walking around this earth today talking about their wounded spirit. And yet the cause of that wounded spirit is something they will not let go of. It's something they hold to and they hold it as close to them as they possibly can. And it is tearing them apart from the inside out. And all they must do is just drop it. <laughs> You've seen them. You've experienced them. Maybe you've been them from time to time. When you've come to your senses and seen maybe from the word of God or maybe from the Holy Spirit impressing upon you, hey, that thing that's tearing you up, you don't have to carry it. 
that thing that's causing you trouble and heartache and issue, you can just let go. <laughs> Too many wounded spirits are self-inflicted. Too many wounded spirits are, are not let go of, of our own choice. He delves deeper. He says, depend upon it. If you make an idol and God loves you, he will break it. And Christian, if your heart is your idol, God will break it because he needs to be first. So many Christians walk around with their infirmity and it is everything to them. This is who I am. Every conversation leads back to it. Every, every topic gets turned and twisted back to their problem, their issue, their, their hang up. It's become the one thing they can see. And although they might not admit it, and although they might not understand it, or although they might not acknowledge it, they are worshiping it. And God wants to take it away. Not the infirmity itself, but the spirit that has been wounded by it. I've met so many people that talk about getting hurt in church. And I understand that. It happens. But the vast majority of Christianity has been helped in church. And if you've been hurt in church, the fix for that is in church. <laughs> I met a lady one time and we were talking and she had this ministry uh, of visiting churches. She said, I'll, I'll go to a church, I'll spend a, a Sunday there and I'll just be a blessing to that pastor, those people, whatever. And then we move on and go somewhere else. And I thought, that's good, that's fine. But that's not what you're called to. And the longer we talked, I knew where we were headed. She got hurt in church. <laughs> and so she just bounces around. Why? Because she doesn't want to get hurt again. The whole time she's hurting herself because she's not sitting still long enough for God to look at her, <laughs> for God to do something in her heart. I've sat in a pew longer than I've sat anywhere else <laughs> in my life. Sometimes God is working on me, not just a service by service basis, but a week by week basis, a month by month basis, and sometimes a year by year basis. This gets thick sometimes. And God has to talk to me again and again and again and again. God will chase you down. He can find you wherever you're at. You say, well, I'd go to any church and worship there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But God's going to do a work in your church, in your spot, with your pastor, with your Bible. And it's so much easier when we find ourselves where we should be. He says a Quaker lady once stood up to speak in a little meeting. And all that she said was, verily, I perceive that children are idols. She did not know why she said it, but there was a mother there who had been wearing black for years after her child had been taken away. She had never forgiven her God for what he had done. Now this is an evil that is to be rebuked. I dare not comfort those whose spirits are wounded in this fashion. If they carry even their mourning too far, we must say to them, dear friend, is not this rebellion against God? May not this be petulant? Instead of patience, may there be, may there not be very much here, which is not at all according to the mind of Christ. We may sorrow and be grieved when we lose our loved ones, for we are men, but we must moderate our sorrow and bow our will to the will of the Lord, for are we not also men of God? There's a lot there as he speaks. Those who have allowed their anger at God to become an idol. Their wounded spirit has become the very thing that they bow down to. He says there are some who have been greatly wounded, no doubt, through sickness. A wounded spirit may be the result of diseases which seriously shake the nervous system. I don't know why in our circles it seems to be the, the trendy thing that everybody's got a, a, a physical ailment. Um, and I say that carefully because I know there are many people that are, that are afflicted by things and, and truly afflicted. But it has become this, it's almost as if we were told all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then the first thing that comes around that's difficult for us to deal with, we say, well, that must be my cross to bear. That must be the thing that I must overcome and it becomes our identity. It becomes the thing that, that we put first and foremost. It's, it's on our business cards. It's on our name tag. It's on our bumper sticker. It's the thing that we are. And yet God simply wants us to endure quietly. Endure trusting him. 
take it on and move forward. I've met people that are caught up on things that happened 25 years ago. They can't move forward. I understand heartache happens. I understand it, but it's the wounded spirit. And sometimes we get frustrated with people. They get stuck. They get caught. They can't move. Listen to this. He writes this from the perspective of those that deal with physical infirmity, with disease. But, but think about this in any capacity. He says there are some forms of physical disorder in which a person lying in bed feels great pain, even through another person simply walking across the room. Uh, some of you have probably been in situations like that. I mean, just grievously afflicted with some kind of, of, of issue physically that it just seems like, I mean, just even, even the footsteps across the room, the sound or the vibration of it could cause pain, could cause issue. And again, we're looking at this physically, but think of this spiritually as he says this. Oh, you say, that's mere imagination. Well, you may think so if you like. If you, if you are ever in that painful condition, and he says, as I have been many a time, I will warrant that you will not talk in that fashion again. We cannot take notice of such fancies, says one. I suppose that you would like to run a steamroller across the room just for the sake of strengthening their nerves. How often that is our approach. We hear somebody's hang up, somebody's issue, somebody's wounded spirit, and our response to that is simply get over it. Our response is simply pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Be happy, right? You should have joy in the Lord. Get over it. Careful, Christian. He says, but if you have the spirit of Christ, you would want to walk across the room as though your feet were flakes of snow. You would not wish to cause the poor sufferer any additional pain. I beg you, never grieve those upon whom the hand of God is lying in the form of depression of spirit. But be very tender and gentle with them. You need not encourage them in their sadness. But at the same time, let there be no roughness in dealing with them. They have many very sore places. And the hand that touches them should be soft as down. Our response to folks and their needs, our response to folks and their maladies and their issues needs to be like Christ. Jesus met many people that had wounded spirits. He did not crush any of them. He addressed them and he pointed them in the right direction. But too often, the bruise that hurts the most is the one we like to poke. And say, this is a problem. This needs fixed. You need to get over this. This is going to hold you back. You know what might hold them back further as a Christian who is not gracious with them? Now to that person, I say, yes, through the Holy Spirit, we need to let go of that. We need to move past that. We need to let that wounded spirit heal. Let it heal. But to the rest, I say, be very careful. So what is the wounded spirit? Well, it's many different things. But it is fragile, most importantly. The second question, we see a wounded spirit who can bear, but the first half of the verse says the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. And so the question that we must answer, and uh, as Spurgeon covers very, very effectively, is what is that sound spirit which will sustain a man's infirmity? Boy, do I need that spirit. I need to know what it is that I got to do. What can I plug in? What can I practice? What can I do in order for me to be able to handle that thing, to get that spirit back to where it should be that I can then hold my infirmities, bear my infirmities, move past my infirmities. He says such a spirit may be found in a minor degree in merely natural men, but imperfectly. The Bible says God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. And we may be able to come up with coping mechanisms and things, mantras that we may say to help us get through. But if we're truly going to get the wounded spirit to be healed, the power and strength of mind by which Christian men are able to bear their infirmities as of, is of a higher kind, Spurgeon says, than that which comes from either stoicism or from natural sternness or from obedience to any of the precepts of human philosophy. And so what is that spirit? Where can I find it? Well, let me begin by saying it is your spirit. It just needs to be cultivated in very specific ways. And I've got four ways that we can cultivate our spirit so that it may be able to bear our infirmities. Number one, it is a gracious spirit. And again, I don't take credit for this. This is Spurgeon, but it comes from our God. And uh, it helped me. I hope it can help you. Number one, a gracious spirit 
wrought in us by the Spirit of God. The spirit that I have naturally is not going to help me get through anything. My human fleshly spirit is the one that complains and argues and, and wants conflict. Uh, we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, and wants, wants to wallow in my sorrows. Wants the, the, the pity of others. It wants the affection of others. Uh, it wants to point out my issues to make sure people know who I am. And don't tread over here. <laughs> all, these, all these tough uh, you know, conservative people waving the flag that says, don't tread on me. And uh, that originally was a warning, but I think today so many have that. And really it's speaking more truth than they think because it's a plea. Please don't tread on me because I can't handle it. That is the flag that we often will fly. That's my spirit. But the Holy Spirit is far different. And if I allow that spirit, if we follow and walk in that spirit, it will be a gracious spirit that is wrought in us by the spirit of God. Spurgeon says this, if thou wouldst bear thy trouble without complaining. That's the big key. It says, if thou wouldst sustain thy burden without fainting, if thou wouldst mount on wings as eagles, if thou wouldst run without weariness and walk without fainting, thou must have the life of God within thee. Thou must be born again. Thou must be in living union with him who is the strong one and who by the life which he implants within thee can give thee of his own strength. I do not believe that anything but that which is divine will stand the wear and tear of this world's temptations and of this world's trials and troubles. We count on him for salvation. We count on him to be born again, to renew that spirit within us for eternal life. And yet day by day we go by and try to walk in our own power. We try to bear those infirmities with our own perseverance, with our own strength. Spurgeon wisely says he doesn't believe that there's anything but that which is divine that will stand the wear and tear of this world's temptations and of this world's trials and troubles. It has to be him. It has to be. Secondly, this morning, it needs to be a spirit cleansed in the precious blood of Christ. Tell you what, we walk around dirty. We walk around with a level of just separation from God, a level of, of disobedience, a level of carnality, a level of, of us. Spurgeon says, believe me when I say that I would rather suffer such physical pangs as may belong to hell itself that I would endure the wrath of God in my spirit. Too often we do not look for that. We don't allow ourselves to see the other side of God. We're going to talk about that at 11 o'clock. When we understand God's reaction to our sin and our flesh and our self, we ought to run from that as fast as we can. And a spirit that will sustain our infirmities is a spirit that is cleansed in the precious blood of Christ. He says, for there is nothing that can touch the very marrow of our being like a sense of divine anger when it comes upon the soul. The Bible says, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And if you've ever, if you've never cracked open this book and felt like it has cut you to pieces, you might want to check your spirit. Because chances are we've strayed a little. <laughs> Chances are we've allowed some things in our heart that need to be cleaned up and cut out and fixed, and God is faithful to do so. Listen to this. He says, When God seems to dip his arrows in the lake of fire and then shoot them at us till they wound the very apple of our eye and our whole being seems to be a mass of pain and misery. So that sounds harsh. Yes, and if you do not crave that when it comes to your sin, then your sin has not become exceeding sinful to you. If you do not want God with the fire of hell to set you on fire for him to go back in the right direction, then you do not hate it as much as he does. Our spirits must be cleansed in the precious blood of Christ if our spirit is ever to sustain our infirmities. 
Too many folks walk around with a wounded spirit full of sin, and it breaks my heart to see it because they'll never be able to sustain that infirmity if that is not cleansed. Number three, what is that spirit, that sound spirit which will sustain a man's infirmity? It is a spirit which exercises itself daily unto a growing confidence in God. Let's, let's run that through again. A spirit which exercises itself daily unto a growing confidence in God. And I just have to read what he said because he, he puts it together so well. Spurgeon said this, Strength lieth in believing. He who can trust can work. And he who can trust can suffer. The spirit that can sustain a man in his infirmity is the spirit that can say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Come what may, I will not doubt my God, for his word is strong and steadfast. Although my house be not so with God, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. That's a combination of about three or four quotes from men in scripture who found themselves in such dire straits that everyone around them said, just stop, just give up, just be done. Give in to the wounded spirit. And they said, no. We've talked a lot about suffering and how God can use that. And the spirit that will sustain those things, that will lift us up, that will hold us in the midst of it all, is one that every single day grows more and more confident in their God. This is counterintuitive. <laughs> this is against our mind because our mind says, the more God lays upon me, the less I trust him. The more God allows me to have to endure, the less I want to be near him. The more that God makes me go through, the less I'm going to feel like I love him. And yet God has designed it the exact opposite way around. I said before, and I've said often about my father-in-law, the question asked many times, why him? Why did he have to go through this? And my response, I didn't always feel it, but my response was, why not him? Why not? By the end of his life, he had trusted Christ. And as well as he knew how, he would try to give him the glory and try to be a witness in the midst of it all. But those of us that know him know he's going to come through. Those of, uh, of us that have been through it before know that he can and he will. Mark Rogers sings a wonderful song. He'll, he'll do it again. Just take a look at where you were and where you are now. We talk about trauma. I think I mentioned this last week. I, I went through that. Yes, and just saying that phrase means you're not there anymore. <laughs> I've come through it. I'm on the other side. That means that whatever you're going through now, you will get through. And you say, well, preacher, what if I'm the one that's been in it the whole time? Well, then take a look at what he's done for others. Every day, our confidence in him ought to grow. Spurgeon says this, oh, dear sirs, I am sure that if God calls you to do business in great waters, you will want the great bower anchor with you. You will not feel safe without it. When the Lord calls you to battle with your spiritual foes, you will feel the, ne the necessity of having upon you the whole armor of God. And above all, the Bible says, you will need to take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. Faith. Faith is not what we often say it is. Faith is not simply believing God will. Because you can have faith and yet not think God's going to come through. We see it in scripture. Jesus says, you know, uh, to the man whose daughter, I believe it's whose daughter is sick. He says, I, I will if thou believest. He says, I believe. He says, help thou mine unbelief. You know what he's saying? Lord, I I'm just putting my faith in you. You've got to do it. My flesh says you can't. But I'm putting my faith in you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. It's not a hope so. It's not a well, I, I think God will. It's in spite of what we say, asking God anyway. Fully expecting it to fall on its face, we say, but God, I'm giving it to you anyway, and I'd like you to do it. Faith. True faith. 
exercise daily a growing confidence in God. And lastly this morning, what is that sound spirit which will sustain a man's infirmity? It is a spirit that is perfectly consecrated. Perfectly consecrated. Our spirit set aside for God. Our spirit made to be that special thing that God has touched. Spurgeon says, the man who is free from all secondary motives. Think about that with me. All secondary motives. Christian, what's your purpose? Why'd you get up this morning? Why'd you get in your car this morning? Why'd you come to church this morning? Why did you marry the person you married? Why'd you eat what you had for breakfast this morning? Why'd you get into foster care? Why'd you become a member of Harmony Baptist Church? Why'd you decide to wear that shirt today? You say, well, those all have different reasons. Those all have different motives. Yes, but if our prime directive is to glorify God, then we can integrate that into every one of those decisions. You say, I can choose my cereal to glorify God? Absolutely can. God is against Reese's Puffs. That's just the way it is. <laughs> no, what you put in your body matters. Why? Because my purpose is to glorify God. You need trash? Eventually, that won't glorify God. No one wants to be on their deathbed and have the, the eulogy be presented and say, well, they didn't take care of their body. They must not have thought it was important to God. You say, preacher, that sounds very trivial. Yes, it is. But if our prime and single and only directive is to glorify God, then nothing is trivial. Nothing is insignificant. Because all of it is a life that God has given us that we must put together to glorify him. Every decision we make, that should be our first thought. Will this glorify God? Can I glorify God in that decision? Will this take glory away from God? And when we take that and apply that to our spirit in the midst of our infirmities, the sound spirit that will sustain our infirmity is one that is perfectly consecrated for the purpose of glorifying God. Spurgeon says, the man who is free from all secondary motives, who lives only for God's glory, says, if he is sick, how can I glorify God upon my bed? If he is in health, he cries, how can I glorify God in my vigor? If he is rich, he says, how can I glorify God with the possessions which he has put under my stewardship? If he is poor, he says, there must be some advantage about my poverty. How can I best use it to the glory of God? He looks to see not how he can comfort himself, but how he can most successfully fight his master's battles. And in that, we see our suffering differently. In that, we see like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. The Lord gave and the Lord took away. And his response is, blessed be the name of the Lord. Every single time. I know what it's like to try to find what we call the silver lining, right? Well, there's good in everything. We look at Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That means I love God. I'm called unto his purpose. He loves me. There must be some good for me. Wait, 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 wait. Spurgeon says, who is free from all secondary motives. Your happiness is a secondary motive. Your comfort is a secondary motive. Your ability to live a life that is pleasing to you is a secondary motive. I understand it's hard to live. <laughs> I understand it's easy to preach and hard to live. But if our spirit is going to sustain those infirmities, it must be one that is perfectly consecrated to glorifying God to the best of our ability. How are we to avoid a wounded spirit so far as we find that it is evil? There are three things. We understand what the wounded spirit is. We see what the sound spirit is that will sustain our infirmities. To simply recap, it's a gracious spirit wrought in us by the spirit of God. It is a spirit that is cleansed in the precious blood of Christ. It is the spirit which exercises itself daily unto a growing confidence in God. And it is a spirit that is perfectly consecrated. That's the one we go for. How do we avoid a wounded spirit? Number one, by never offending your conscience. 
when we make sure our spirit is right with God and we're living by his word and we're doing everything God has led us to, your conscience will guide you. The Bible, or the, the Bible, the world says that. Let your conscience be your guide. Uh, Pinocchio ended up in a whale, <laughs> like Jonah. Jiminy Cricket did not help him. That's not what the Bible means when it speaks about our conscience. The Bible says that our spirit bears witness with his spirit. And when our conscience is guided spiritually by the Holy Ghost, it is the Holy Spirit of God like a compass, saying that way. You know what a compass doesn't do? It doesn't tell you the direction you want to go. It just tells you which way is right. We follow a compass. All right, that way is north. And we turn this way, and the compass goes that way. Nope, 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 that way. That way, that way, there you go. <laughs> That's how our conscience works. That's how the Holy Spirit of God works. Too many people say, well, God hasn't killed me. <laughs> God hasn't, you know, God hasn't, God hasn't told me that's what I shouldn't do. No, you're absolutely right. He just said, that's the way you want to go. And we ignore it. Well, God hasn't stopped me over here yet. Right, because he just says, go that way. <laughs> How do we avoid a wounded spirit? By never offending your conscience. Number two, get a clear view of the gospel. When we understand who we are and who God is and what he offered to us, boy, it puts everything in perspective. You got a hard time giving up your will? Just think about the gospel. Just think about what God did for you. Just think about the exchange that God Almighty made to save you from hell. That puts everything back into perspective. And number three, how do we avoid a wounded spirit? I'm not talking about repairing one. I'm talking about avoiding one is live very near to God as close as you possibly can. A wounded spirit will drive you as far away from God as quickly, more quickly than anything else. We get wounded, we get hurt, we get discouraged, we get depressed, and we almost, we set ourselves on a one-way track away from God. Christian, that ought not be. So what is that wounded spirit? It is one in which we've taken ourselves and allowed ourselves to let our hurt and our pain and our suffering be more than God in our life. How do we have a sure, sound spirit that will sustain our infirmities? We've listed many of those ways. And it is living as closely to God as we possibly can. And may I end with this final sentence. You are not alone. You say, I know, preacher, the Lord's with me. That's not what I'm talking about. If we have a hundred people in this room, there are a hundred wounded spirits. Different levels, different stages. Some have overcome them. Some are yet to come. But there is not a person within any room that can congregate under the sight of our God who has not gone through something that has wounded their spirit or who is not about to go through something that has wounded their spirit. The devil wants us to think we're by ourselves, that nobody's had it like me, that this is specific and maybe even God can't handle it. Christian, those are lies. We're all in this together. As we think about the wounded spirit and how we might affect others, may it be our purpose when we see that in others, not to tear down, not to poke, but to help heal, to help guide, not encouraging them in their sadness or their depression, but encouraging them in the right directions. And I know sometimes folks don't want to hear it, but just a gentle reminder, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We might escort them back to the spirit that can sustain their infirmities. I hope these lessons have been a help to you, a series here on the wounded spirit. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmities, but a wounded spirit who can bear? We haven't answered that question yet, but I hope I've given you enough to let you understand it is our God. He can handle it. Let's pray.